There we go. Well, hello everyone. My name is Jill Barkley Roy, and I am honored to serve as the affiliate director at Emerge. Here at Emerge, we are the nation's premier organization for recruiting and training and supporting Democratic women to run for office and win. Um, this week, we are live on Races to Watch with um, women running for office. And today, we are really excited to be joined by Kirsten Harris Talley, who's a candidate for Washington State Representative. Kirsten is running in the 37th district in Washington, which includes various neighborhoods in Seattle, such as Central District, Chinatown International District, Rainier Valley, Beacon Hill, Skyway, and Renton. She is a mother, an educator, a wife, a neighbor, and she is running so that we can change our communities together. Kirsten is running to build an office and team where the community feels like they have access to what they need and to ensure their voices are heard. She believes in building community power and bringing policies to the forefront of the conversation. Kirsten's career shows all of this. <laughs> she has a passion for advocacy. She was previously the program manager at Kadera, the program and political director at the Progress Alliance of Washington, and currently serves as the executive, or most currently served as the executive director of NARAL Pro-Choice Washington. I love it when advocates and activists run for office. It's my favorite thing. Um, so Kirsten is the founding board member of Surge Reproductive Justice, an organization that mobilizes communities to build a world where all people can make powerful, self-determined choices for their bodies and their future. And to date, Kirsten is the only endorsed Democrat running with support from the progressive elected officials and community leaders. She has been endorsed by Congresswoman Jupayo, Senator um, oh, Saldana, Council Member Morales, and many, many more. And she is one of the many women who represent the future of politics in this country. And I am really happy that you've decided to join us here today. Welcome, Kirsten. Thank you for having me, Jill, and thank you, Emerge, for creating a space where, you know, democratic activists like me can see ourselves running. It means a lot. Well, let's jump right in. Can you give us an update on how your race is going? We're so close to Election Day and obviously have already started voting in most of our states. Yes, yes. Here in Washington, you know, our campaign is COVID safe. We're with community every way we can be. Um, it's going well. I, you know, none of us knew in January when we announced we'd be doing this with the backdrop of a pandemic or the Black Lives Matter movement having the attention it deserves. We're on conversations like this on Zoom. We're doing our community vision sessions on Zoom. We're having house. We're doing social distance gatherings to get materials out to folks. Um, so feeling blessed in many ways um, in this moment, considering all the shifts we've had all had to make. So feeling good, feeling centered, you know, it's baking a cake, it's in the oven, and now it's just showing up and, and trusting our neighbors. Well, I love that metaphor. So um, hopefully everyone in your world is staying safe and healthy. I know, you know, we are in the middle of two pandemics in this country, both the COVID-19 pandemic, and then obviously the pandemic of racial injustice. Um, so our hope is that all Emerge women are staying safe and staying healthy during this time. Um, your state was one of the first with a COVID-19 outbreak. Um, so tell me a little bit about how that you mentioned, you alluded to this, that it changed your race pretty dramatically. No one planned to be running for office during a pandemic, that's for sure. Um, so how has it changed the race for you? And are there particular voter communities that you're focusing on as we continue to fight this pandemic in our country? Yes, I mean, it's shifted all our lives so dramatically and so quickly. Here in the 37th, we're a really unique district. We were drawn as the most diverse legislative district in Washington state in 2010. And we stretch from Renton Skyway, north through the Rainier Valley, through Chinatown International District. And then there's a carve out in a neighborhood called Pioneer Square that has also almost all of our urban native community um, serving organizations. So really a reflection of the diversity of our state. And our neighbors were hit very quickly and very deeply um, when COVID hit. As you noted, we were one of the first states that had good medical infrastructure and testing to know that our numbers were rising quickly mm -hmm. here. Our governor immediately took action to try to keep folks safe immediately. We've been continuing to be in COVID safe guidance here as a state, which is wonderful. But it's also had a huge impact on small businesses. Many of the businesses here are black, brown, indigenous, and immigrant owned. 
Um, you know, there's a lot of mutual aid networks that started up really immediately. Whereas we're in a neighborhood that's always been about mutual aid. For us, it's just how you show up for your neighbor. So our campaign really immediately, when all that happened, sat, we're all organizers and activists and asked, how do we show up for neighbors right now? So our immediate thing was how to plug into mutual aid networks, get folks connected to resources. And our mantra has been, we're physically distant, we're still socially connected in solutions. So that's really been our orientation. And we've kept up conversations and we've needed to. So we just had our youth team. We have a 50 member youth team who's doing organizing. We organized a small business forum last week to have deep conversations. How are folks gonna weather this storm? Um, and you know, I'm a PTA parent, we're in public schools. Uh, my fourth grader and kindergartner in the next room online. So figuring out all of us, right? How to balance homeschooling along with all that we do in community and with the campaign. So in many ways, it has forced us to reflect on how we are more inclusive. In many ways, our campaign is more accessible for disability justice than it would have been, right? We're having a lot of clarity about that. Folks who actually don't aren't able to participate in standard ways you do campaigns are online. So that's been sort of a blessing around some of these things in ways uh, neighbors have been able to interact and come in. So we're going to keep continuing that and work to have government continue to show up for our neighbors as we weather this storm and come out on the other side. That's incredible. Yeah, we have really thought about that at Emerge. You know, not only have all of our candidates had to shift their races, we've shifted how we've done things too in terms of our training. And you're right, we've been able to provide training to folks that we weren't as easily able to in the past. And it's just been, you know, an, an interesting opportunity, a moment to say, instead of pausing, how do we pick up speed? So yes. I, love it. I, I was a recipient of that here in Washington State. You all piloted the first boot camp online and I normally would not have been able to participate and got to participate with my cohort and it was such an amazing experience so thank you for continuing to innovate in those ways it's making well we are very thankful to you and we're very thankful to Emerge Washington Karen Besserman our executive director there is a rock star and we're just thankful that we've continued on and that women like you have continued to run it's really really inspiring so Thank you for that. So let's dive in a little bit deeper. So you have 20 years of experience in policy and advocacy. That's awesome. You're so qualified to serve. Um, so tell us how that's prepared you to fight, um, you know, for statewide bipartisan policies and, and a little bit about the policies that you're planning to champion. Yes, I, it's interesting, right? I'm a black LGBTQ woman. I've not necessarily seen folks who look like me. You know, if my neighbors see fit to have me elected, I'll be the first out black woman in who's ever served at the state level in Washington state. That makes a difference. And, you know, um, really right now thinking through what it's going to look like on that side, we're thinking about what we've already built together. So to your point, you know, Early on in my career, the first policy I got to work on was the Healthy Youth Act, which was making sure we had science-based sex ed in our schools. We're now defending that on our ballot with Approve 90. I feel like I came full circle serving at NARAL Pro-Choice Washington to steward um, an expansion on that policy to be more inclusive of LGBTQ youth and consent um, education, right? So um, to have 12 years doing that policy in 2008 to 2020, right, has given me a deep understanding change does not always come all at once you have to stay steward of it throughout and working collectives being an activist i think has really also shaped the way i think about policy wins right this summer here locally i was proud to be marching in the streets with our neighbors literally every day for almost 80 days um, to demand change in policing policy and the way policing is happening in our communities and it shifted wholly the conversations about whether we're funding the police and what it means to fund the police and keep increasing funding there, but to decrease and divest from things we know we need, like education, mm -hmm. healthcare infrastructure, and to really think about resilience and how we're going to heal our planet, which is huge for our district too. So I feel like the 20 years I've been in this work, working in collective and that inside outside strategy it's really shifted the way I've thought about how policy change happens. It doesn't happen because someone gets elected and goes into you know, a room to squabble with other elected officials. It happens because neighbors show up and make sure that their voices are heard and that those who have that power take action on what they need. And so that's how we've been thinking about everything. And I'm excited about what that looks like for me and my neighbors after November 3rd. 
I'm excited too. I hope that your legislature uh, live streams, uh, committee hearings, and um, floor debates because I want to see a really packed full gallery of people who are there for that issue that you've helped organize. So uh, <laughs> thank you for that. That's going to be exciting to watch. Uh, you mentioned this, uh, um, you know, climate change. So your governor is one of the elected officials who's really at the forefront of climate change. And this is obviously one of your priorities as well. So where do you think Washington currently stands on the fight against climate change? And where do you hope to see it evolve? So Washington is getting a lot of things right. I mean, on a many levels, we're progressive on a lot of axes. But as with many states, when you add a lens of income inequity, or racial disparity, all of a sudden, right, those numbers really shift. Our district is deeply impacted by climate. We have actually the worst air quality in all of Washington state. Mm -hmm. and in part that's because we are near SeaTac International Airport, mm -hmm. where of course all of our standard travel happens, but also between two airfields for Boeing Commercial Air. And so those three pieces together, and the fact that our neighborhoods were built under redlining that put residents right by industry has impacted really deeply how climate impacts our neighbors. We have a lot we can do right away. We need to pass a clean fuel standard so that we can start addressing the air quality and also fossil fuel dependency that we have in our state. Still two thirds of our state electrical infrastructure is dependent on fossil fuel. A third is coal, a third is natural gas. We have an opportunity to expand wind farms and other types of infrastructure in Washington state to move wholly away from fossil fuel and actually stabilize and create more independence as well, because then we wouldn't have to be purchasing and bartering with other states and countries for that fossil fuel infrastructure. And then, of course, we cannot talk about climate and not talk about what has been happening on tribal lands. We have 29 recognized sovereign tribes in Washington state. They've been on the front line of these fights. And quite frankly, it's time for us to really stand up for sovereignty rights and stand beside our indigenous leaders. We have huge opportunities for that in Washington state. And as you mentioned, right, Jay Inslee, he was the climate candidate when he ran for president mm -hmm. on a national scale. I think he brought awareness there. I feel lucky that we have a legislature that has a lot of folks who are in this mode and to have both the executive and legislative side. I'm hoping we can make a lot of bold change quickly with our neighbors because we have to start healing the planet. And I think we can also build an economy with a Green New Deal as we're rethinking what we're going to do to get out of COVID that also has jobs that heals our community and economy to be in concert with our planet. That kind of vision and what that could be, I get really excited about, you know, for me, what my kids could have as, as both a world and job and economy and infrastructure that really holds them that real, is really different for me and the generations before me. Well, that I can see how much your community and your future constituents and your kids inspire you around that. So thank you for that. Um, and I mentioned, you know, we're, I'm way over here in Maine, you're way over there in Washington, but we have a lot in common in our state. So it's great to hear um, your thoughts on tribal sovereignty as well. So thank you. Um, so another few of your top priorities, I'm sure you have many, we could be here all day, but you've talked a lot about um, in your campaign about tax reform and economic justice. So those are also national issues that we're seeing talked about very differently um, yeah. on the presidential debate stage. So can you tell us, um, you know, what's Washington state specific for you when you think about tax reform and economic justice? So Washington State, you know, having all that we have, we actually have the most upside down tax code in the entire country. We come in dead last, number 50 for tax equity, wow. in part because we don't have an income tax. We actually have a constitutional amendment in the mid 40s when we were still very much an extraction economy that's kept us from having that. So we're hugely dependent on d &O taxation and property tax, and that is not enough ever. It's never been enough. In contrast, right, in the state you live in, Maine, you all invest about $22,000 per student in public education. We invest 11, and we're not actually fully funding that yet in Washington state. So that's just one of many examples about what a lack of revenue means for lack of infrastructure and support for our communities. So we have some tools right away we can use. Closing capital gains loopholes is huge. Capital gains is when money makes money. And right now, if you have money that's making money while everyone else is hurting, a little bit of that money to help your neighbors is a good thing. So closing those loopholes would be huge. It would be billions of dollars into our state. We actually passed a working families tax credit at the state level, which is really exciting. We have not actually dedicated resources to it. 
doing that would be a game changer. And for me, policy is only as good as actually how it helps people's lives. So until we put resources behind it, that good policy isn't worth much. Right now, the consideration is $300. I would like to see that increase to $1,200 and possibly two allocations per year because folks are really hurting and that level of dollars would make a huge difference. Mm -hmm. And then we need to move away from the structure we have now that's putting too much burden on small and medium-sized businesses. And we can do that by making sure we actually don't incentivize tax breaks for corporations who are making a lot right now and instead have their fair share, pay their fair share in so that we can use those dollars to invest in the small businesses that we're going to need to weather this storm so that they're still here in our communities on the other side of the pandemic. So there's lots and lots we can do. The thing that that helps me think about it, we created the laws and structure, right, that has us under resource now. That means we can unmake it, which is which is really how we have to think about these things. It's not insurmountable. It's just going to take time, effort, and action. That's right. And organizing. So, all right. I'm excited. I, I was taking notes when you were talking about your plans, and I, I'm going to keep watching. Um, so, shifting gears just a little bit, and you mentioned this earlier, that um, you'll be the first, if you're elected, the first out, did you say you were the, be the first out Black woman elected to your legislature ever? Yes. Wow. Okay. That's a big deal. And at Emerge, we love to say first, not the last. Um, so one of the central themes of this election season is thinking about all kinds of diversity, right? It's important for Americans and future generations to see someone who looks like them in office um, and, and as leaders of communities. So um, this is long overdue <laughs> and we are fighting for, um, I love that you're multitasking. Um, <laughs> I am listening, but I'm also getting my kindergartner their mermaid book. So I, but I'm, I'm with you. I love it. I love it. You keep, you keep getting the kindergartner the mermaid book. That'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so this is long overdue. Our country is really thinking about our fight for equality. Yeah. Sounds like she's got a mermaid book. That's an important fight too. I'm sure in your household. <laughs> So let's talk about that. Let's talk about what this all means for your candidacy. The, you know, if you can't see it, you can't be it rule and how that how that's impacting you. So what would it mean to you to to make sure that if you're the first, you're not the last and that there's even more people of color and LGBTQ candidates running for office in the future? It's such a great question. I mean, as I said, right, I, I had never seen anyone necessarily with my lived experience and the intersection of my identities in office. And just seeing it, right, lets you know that, that that reality is possible. So as you know, and I love that what you said, right, the first but not the last. Um, it's sobering, right, the number of firsts that we're experiencing as a country. I think it speaks to the, the structural inequity that was cemented mm -hmm. in this country. Um, and, and it's little things, right, you know, having folks like emerge infrastructure right that's built around giving care to folks it's not easy to be the first in things folks question your ability they question your validity um and i feel blessed that i've built really a really wonderful network with emerge sisters and others of folks who are saying no what you're saying is unique because your lived experience is unique and that's valuable to folks um and the other piece right is that you have to vote and elect and give dollars. Like politics requires us to show up in those ways. And so to be able to do that for others in the sphere too. Washington State for the first time right now, I'm also in a race in the 37th. I can't find any other race where the top two candidates were both black. That's unique. We are for the first time having 10 black FIMS running simultaneously in Washington State, which means we could shift dramatically the whole scope of representation there and what it looks like then to have same experience conversations in caucus so that the actual lived experience we have is seen through and picked up and folks have a deeper understanding. That's how good laws happen. So I'm excited about the possibilities with all of that. Uh, that sent chills uh, through my whole body. So thank you. I, I'm put, I hope all of you are successful because it does make a difference, you know, as, as an LGBTQ plus person myself, when there's just one of us in a space, it's different than when there's three or more of us in a space. And, you know, the more you acquire, the more the tune has to change. So, um, so here at Emerge, as you know, and as you mentioned, we are building a network to encourage and support women running for office. Um, we're doing that through trainings in our state specifically, in our boot camps and our signature programs. Um, so I think once 
Okay, you're back. Good. Uh, <laughs> like once we have a mermaid book in hand, no. why did you choose to join Emerge? And what was your experience like at Emerge and, and your hopes for Emerge in the future there in Washington State? Well, you know, I am not unlike other women. As we know, women have to be asked, I think it's an average of eight times before we, you know, run. And I had many, many neighbors ask me to run. And I kept saying, I'm an activist. I'm <laughs> like, what, why are you asking? You know, um, and the same thing with Emerge. I've had three different folks approach me and say, you should really think about if you're thinking of running, joining this Emerge cohort. And Finally, um, one of the board members, Charmaine, here in Washington, really sat down with me. She asked me out to coffee and really sat down and described what it was beyond just the nuts and bolts of understanding what it was to run for office, but actually what it was to build that network of support. And that, for me, was the game changer. It was like, oh, this is actually about building right a sort of sorority of folks who understand uniquely what it is that you're going through so that you can support and hold each other. And that shifted um, to me saying yes. And it was an amazing experience to have folks, you know, from every generation, from all over Washington State, we're a very diverse state. Um, all of us were newbies or folks who were just on the cusp of thinking about whether they would run in the future. And so to really be able to have a space where we could come in and say, this is scary, this is new. I have uncertainties despite all that I'm bringing with me. Um, and have someone hear that and say, that's par for the course and we got you, that, that is just a unique experience always in life. So it was a really wonderful experience. And also the tactical piece for me, it, I was very hesitant um, because of the sort of things that people say to talk about. I wanted to talk about my resume more than me as a person. And they really gave me license and the tools to be like, no, you can be vulnerable and talk about yourself as a person and be whole in this experience. And that's just such a wonderful gift to have because, you know, you can't do this work and not be whole. Um, too often, I think we're, we're expected to have sacrifice to serve. And I think we can be whole and um, have mutual gain in service. So Emerge helped me find a path for that. And I, I will ever forever have gratitude for that. Well, we have gratitude for you because you exemplify everything that we believe here at Emerge. And, you know, if you're not your whole authentic self, if you don't bring all of yourself to the table, if you don't stop and get a mermaid book in the middle of an interview about your campaign for office, then other women who are moms, who are working, who are activists, who are women of color, who are indigenous, who are LGBT, they don't see themselves either. And so I think it's so important every time an Emerge woman speaks authentically and runs authentically, she's building permission for another woman to say yes when she's asked to run. So I like I'm saying yes to ourselves and our communities. That's, yes, that's yes. The that is absolutely right. So, um, so Emerge Washington is um, just about three years old. And if you want to find out about Emerge Washington and all of the incredible training programs they are doing, you can find them at EmergeWashington.org. You can also check out our website, Emerge America. Immediately following the election, um, we're going to be doing some information sessions and some sessions on, you know, thinking about running for office. So please sign up for our email list to find out more about that, because hopefully you've seen in this interview today that you can do it and you should do it and you owe it to yourself and to your community to step up and run and we are here to support you. So um, Kirsten, if someone wants to find out more about you and your race, what would they do? Yeah, so please plug in. We're a scrappy community campaign. As I mentioned, we have a youth team. We're doing field work you know, in this internet space. We're really trying to innovate in what it is to organize with our neighbors. You can check us out at electkht.org. If you can make a gift of your time, dollars, or talent to what we're doing, we have phone banks, we have block squads, and also we're not accepting corporate PAC, fossil fuel, or police union dollars. So we're really building this because we believe the way that we fundraise and how that comes in is actually how we then serve and who we're accountable to. So would love you all to join us. You can also see us on all the socials. My youth team even has me dancing on TikTok if you want to have a little fun. So please check us out at ElectKHT on Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram, and TikTok as well. And we would love to see you all in any of our community vision sessions or online forums from anywhere. We welcome you. 
Well, thank you. I, I might have to check some of them out too. I had said at the beginning of this that I thought this might be the best part of my day and I'm absolutely right. Thank you, Kirsten, for joining me today, for sharing about your race, for sharing your life, for being so authentic. I'm really excited for you. And this episode of Races to Watch will be available on our YouTube channel. Thanks for everyone who turned in live. It's going to live here permanently. And you should subscribe to our YouTube channel for updates from our team and great interviews like this with Emerge Women from all across the country and all different backgrounds who are running and who are going to win. So thank you so much, Kirsten. Thank you, everyone, for watching. And um, about two weeks, just under two weeks left. Let's go.